I call it a replicator. It is a simply a duplicating machine, but it's a duplicating machine that can make exact copies of everything. That's how the British physicist and science fiction writer Arthur C. Clarke described his idea of a 3D printer in 1964. And Clarke, at the same time, posed the question, can we imagine a world in which objects can be made as easily as today we can make books? Oh yes, I think we can, and, and much more. My name is uh, Michael Fenberg, I'm the director of the Zero Project, and in the next hour we would um, like to talk about 3D print and its full potential. Above all, for a world with zero barriers, because 3D, 3D printing offers radically new possibilities for producing assistive tools, not only personalized, but also very cost effectively and independent of location. Here with me uh, to moderate this session is Fritz Ruhm, a renowned journalist from Austria with an expertise in technology and innovation and author and editor of many pieces that you can find in the Zero Project research, including the now new Zero Project Almanac. Fritz. Thank you, Michael. My name is Fritz Ruhm. To describe myself, I'm a nervous guy because I'm doing this uh, for the first time in English at least. Uh, I have dark hair, dark eyes because of my Colombian roots, so Hola Colombia. Uh, pale face because it's winter outside. And uh, I have the honor now to uh, present you some facts and figures that are important to grasp the full potential of 3D printing. After that, I would like to share with you some exciting projects from our Zero Project Network. We will also have live connections to innovators of these projects and as Andreas already mentioned, please send us your questions, your comments in the chat for this session or on the community wall. Depending on the remaining time, we will try to cover some of them at the end of the session. So, what is 3D and 3D printing and where are its origins? Chuck Hull is considered the father of 3D printing. He officially invented 3D printing in 1983 and presented the first 3D printer in 1987. Much earlier, as Michael already told, Arthur C. Clarke, who also wrote the book 2001, A Space Odyssey, had his idea of a replicator. He presented it in a program of the BBC series, The Knowledge Explosion, in 1964. And in it, by the way, Clark also predicted the internet. So, Michael, you have some facts. Yeah. Um, so, uh, back to reality and uh, back to uh, 3D now. Uh, and the reality is, is as fantastic as the world that Arthur C. Clarke described. To there, today, there is a number of different printing processes used depending on different materials and on the requirement uh, that the end product uh, has to meet. But let us now watch a video that explains 3D print. It's just two minutes. 3D printing with Tinker and Botch. So how does 3D printers work? Well, first we need something to print. We need to create a 3D model on the computer. There are hundreds of websites where you can find and download 3D models and print them out straight away. Or you can design your own using 3D modeling software. There is lots of software to choose from, but all use roughly the same method. You start with a basic shape, change the size, change the shape, add shapes together and cut bits away. Then, when you're happy with your finished model, you're ready for stage two slicing. Once you have your 3D model, it is sent to 3D printing. Software that scans it and then slices it into sessions to help the printer understand the shape and how to print. We are now ready to print. Printing. But first we need filament. Filament is the material that the models are printed from. You can print in any number of material from plastic, metal or ceramic or even chocolate. Our printer has two main moving parts. The print plate that moves up and down and the print head that can move in any direction. The print head has a heating element and once the filament is fed into it, it heats it up so it melts. 
The print head then draws the outline of the first slice with the melted filament and fills it in. The plate moves down so the next slice can be printed. This continues until all the slices are printed and our model is complete. There is no sector, no industry for which 3D printing is not an option. The major uses for 3D printing are prototyping, custom and low volume manufacturing and work pieces that would be impossible to create any other way. There have been also some changes in the material used. It's not possible to 3D print not only plastics but also ceramics, metal alloys, bronze, silver or quartz sands. The costs for 3D printing, on the other hand, have dropped significantly. In every major city, you can find studios offering private individuals the opportunity to create things using the 3D printing process. And home 3D printers can be bought for well under 1,000 euros. Entry-level models are even available for less than 200 euros. What determines the price of a 3D printer are mainly print speed, size of the build volume that determines the size of the workpiece and what types of materials can be printed. Today, not only printers are affordable, but also the software to create designs has dropped significantly in price or is even available for free on the internet. In addition, also more and more open source blueprints are being shared online, making them available to everyone else at no cost. A global community has emerged around 3D printing, exchanging ideas and providing support to each other. This also helps to expand the potential of 3D printing and brings this technology even to remote places. Let me finish this intro with some exciting facts about 3D printing. In 2000, the first functional biocompatible kidney was printed, but it was not transpl transplanted until three, 13 years later. In 2008, the first leg prosthesis was 3D printed. In 2012, the first jaw prosthesis is 3D printed and translated. In 2011, 2011 sorry, Cornell University in the US began building a 3D printer that prints food and could be used in space. According to an anal analysis by Strategy Ed, from uh, 2018, the market volume for printed products will rise up to 22.6 billion euros by 2030. And the COVID-19 pandemic has given this growth a further boost. Let us now look at what this all means uh, for assistive technologies. Uh, we will show you video summaries of five solutions that have been shortlisted or awarded by the Zero Project this year or in former years. With two of them, we will also have a live conversation in the session and question them a little bit about their model. So let us start with the 3D project from Fundación Once in Spain. On the wall it says Expo 3D Productos de Apoyo. That means Expo 3D Products to Support. A woman speaks in Spanish and a man is translating into sign language. Meanwhile, the nozzle of a 3D printer applies a few millimeters of a mass to a surface. In a showroom, there are tables, a trolley case, and a wheelchair. At the end of the room a large is a large screen. The camera wanders around and shows the items in close-ups. Objects that are 3D printed are shown. Small boxes for pills, cups. The camera switches back to the showroom. Now one can recognize that the trolley case is attached to the wheelchair with a plastic hook. That one could also fix a bag on the side of the wheelchair and there are different kinds of supports for the forearms that are mounted on the table. A support to use the keyboard of a MacBook with only one finger is shown. A small ramp for overcoming steps which can be carried along. And on another day from the archive, there are a lot of people in the showroom and this could be an opening. Para que mis lo necesiten, puedan adaptarlo 
Uh, thank you, Fritz, for this uh, live audio description uh, of, the, of the videos that we see. We have now here with us uh, Paloma Sid Campos from Fundacion Once. Welcome, Paloma. Hi, welcome. Thank you very much, Michael. My son, Chief, thanks to the organization for allowing us to participate with you in this event. Thank you. It's a, it's a pleasure and honor. honor. And uh, you know, Fundacion Once is one of our most important partners, and I think the organization that has uh, been most awarded, maybe of all uh, of all uh, awardees, uh, you're definitely among the, the, the leaders in that field. Uh, Paloma, could you give us a little background uh, what uh, this uh, 3D print program of Fundacion Once is about? It's an award winner of this year, so uh, there's lots more on this, but also where you want to go, where this will lead us, give us some, some background and some perspective on, on this program. Well. Within the framework of this project, Fundación on Thames is to design super products, mainly related to the workplace, in order to make them available to all people. All the designs produced uh, can be found at www.accessibilitas.com, as well as another specific 3D platform. Currently, our goals are focused on the one hand, on getting more designs for the repository for which we have created a communication channel through the aforementioned platform so that anyone can send us their ideas and we will assess the possibility of actually making a design. To achieve this goal, we also want to establish links with entities around the world, which Zero Project has facilitated by setting up a working group on design and 3D printing and the manufacture of low-cost products. On the other hand, in order to bring this technology closer to people with disabilities, we have launched a free printing service for products, which so far is giving us a lot of satisfaction. Thank you, Paloma. So um, it, it, it means this is all free, this is all open source, and everyone who is interested uh, in this model can come, share, connect, and, and you're happy to, to, to share everything that you have. And as you said, these designs are there to download, so everyone who has access to a 3D printer can, can use it and can, can download it and, and has this, this tool or this device, no? Yes, uh, all, uh, all is for free. So everyone can uh, download the models from this uh, portal or from other specific uh, of 3D printing. And uh, even association and organization in Spain can ask us uh, to print uh, different products. So they don't need to have the printer or they don't need to have the, the knowledge to design. We can do this for them. Okay, great. So it would be uh, good uh, to once more also post your contact details in the chat so that people that are watching or uh, reviewing this, uh, this session on, on our uh, streaming system can then get directly in contact with you. I think that's what we're here for the, with the Zero Project to, to create these connections. And as you said, we're also up to create an, an, an online community of people who are interested in this technology that we will uh, both uh, try to develop in the, in, into the future. Um, but what's, what, uh, if you give us a perspective uh, for maybe the next one, two, three years, where you, where you want to be with your program on 3D in the, in, in the years to come, where, where, should it, where is it heading? Well, uh, not sure what is going to happen in two or three years. <laughs> what I can tell you is looking ahead to 2021, uh, we will start a project with Pacto de Productividad de Chile that will allow us to transfer knowledge to professionals in this country with the aim of facilitating access to work for people with disabilities. Um, as I mentioned before, we want to share what we have been learning over the years and learn about other experiences in order to continue training ourselves. We would like this uh, 3D community that is, that is beginning to emerge within Zero Project to become a reference in this technology for all those who want to use it as another resource to equalize the opportunities of people with disabilities in their daily life. And I hope in two or three years, people with disability will, will be more um, involved with this, uh, with this resource. And we would like to, to, train, to, to make trainings uh, for them in order to, to give them the knowledge to make their own pieces and also 
as a skills that they could use in, in a future job. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, thank you, Paloma. One, one uh, closing question. Uh, the uh, the uh, tools and the devices that we saw seem to be targeted towards uh, people with physical disabilities who want to travel and, and so on. But I trust it's, it's basically for a variety of disabilities. And uh, I also trust with Fundación Once having a focus on people who are blind or visually, uh, visually impaired. Uh, you also have something or will offer in the future something for other disabilities as well. Is, am I right? Yes. Yes, uh, for example, we have designed, uh, it's like a font where you can put a, a, the, a word in, for example, in Spanish, and it's been translated into Braille. So you can read directly the, um, the, the, the tag. Uh, we are going to use it to, to sign a space, for example. And in the other hand, we have contacted with a organization of people with learning disabilities, and they uh, are asking us to design different pills box, uh, easy to use for, uh, to the people with learning disabilities and with enough capacity to, to put inside all the pills they use every day. So yes, we are working with, uh, with all types of disabilities, yes. Thank you, Paloma. That was really uh, inspiring and, uh, and, and explained a lot. And uh, we're looking uh, forward to working with you together and, and, and uh, keep connected with you and sharing this within our community. Thank you for coming in live here. And Fritz, we're moving on to the next uh, innovation. Yeah, the next video is about the project My Human Kit from Fab Lab in France. And I will have the honor to do the audio description as well. So, a child's drawing shows a boy playing the drums. Then you see a young man with a prosthetic arm. In French, he explains that he lost his right arm when he was 18. He demonstrates how he can move the fingers and Google something on a laptop. He marks a hit of his search. A, bio a bionic hand costs up to 45,000 euros. Now we see him with a friend working together in a, a laboratory constructing a hand. The two men are working on electronic components, partly with a magnifying glass. The prosthetic arm is now finished, and the narrator is trying out how to move it, its hand and its finger. The two men are in an office of human kit. For the first time, the narrator turns directly to the camera and laughs. He's the founder of My Human Kit, Nicolas Huchet, an athletic man with short hair and a 3D 3-day bird, shots of 3D parts and people working together. Nicolas drives off on a vehicle that looks like a cross between a wheelchair and a micro scooter. Now we see him uh, guiding a drumstick through a prosthetic forearm that has a ring instead of a hand to hold the stick in place. The narrator now sits in front of a real drum set and while starting to play, he says, my name is Nicolas Huchet, I'm a drummer and the founder of My Human Kit. Thank you. So my human kit is mainly about the place, the venue, and bringing the right people together that can personalize the prosthetic by, by any other device, like scooters, musical instruments. It's about bringing professionals from different worlds into one room, like uh, card cam software, any other software, bringing in creative minds, electrician, electronic experts, and many more, depending on the problem to be solved, one by one, since all of them are different. 3D print is just one of the tools that can be used and, and is used among others. Fab Lab is this network of venues that exists and My Human Kit is the program that focuses in on those uh, assistive technologies and technical aids. My Human Kit and Nicolas Huchet are Zero Project awardees this year, so you'll find much more information on our website, zeroproject.org. Fritz. So we come now to the next solution. Chaipa Food Organization from India. Let us watch the next video, please. A workshop where two men are handling parts of prosthetic legs. Next to one is a finished lower leg to which a plastic foot is also attached. The insert says this is the famous Chaipa Food. The man places two of the prosthesis next to each other and checks their height and if they can stand by themselves. 
Someone else finished the top leg on a milling machine. The insert says it was first rolled off the assembly line in 1975. More processing steps follow. Someone applies an elastic compound to the inside of the prosthesis. A man in a wheelchair is testing the prosthesis. The insert says most hospital in Rajasthan sell the product for less than $60. A doctor checking, a man on crutches trying to walk, patients in a waiting room. The insert says estimated 10 million people in India need prosthetics. A man with a prosthetic speaks. He was a victim of a traffic accident but now he can do everything and has no limitation in his daily life. He can even drive a motorcycle. The prosthesis a machine with simple tools. The insert says, completely made in India. The design takes into account local sensitivities. The founder of Jaipur Food appears, Devendra Raj Mehta. He explains that one can wear the prosthesis with shoes. He says, in the Western design, they have to wear the shoes. Now the Oriental culture, if somebody wants to enter a mosque or a temple, he can't enter with shoes on. With the Chaipa food, you can either wear the shoes or not wear the shoes. It permits both. A 3D printer in operation. The insert says, manufacturers are now developing artificial hands using 3D printers. Prashant Gard, engineering graduate, sits next to a printer and explains how the Chaper hand will work. It prints the parts, makes the individual fingers, you can assemble it and the hand is ready. It's a kind of rapid prototyping. We do everything here. Shots from workshops and patients with music in the background. The insert now says, government subsidies and donations help keep the charities like those behind Chaipa Food running. Then the next insert, while they're showing some hands, Chaipa Food, cheap and easy access, provides thousands of life back on the track. You can still see people with prosthesis and talking. Thank you, Fritz, for this uh, really excellent uh, audio description of this video. We have now uh, Pooja Mukul with us, uh, who is the director of the Chaipur Food Rehab Rehabilitation Center and the Chaipur Food uh, Organization. Welcome, Pooja. Thank you, Michael, for having me back again. It's always been a very enriching experience to be part of the Zero Project Conference. And uh, the I was there in 2018, and uh, uh, what I really appreciate is that the relationships that we formed in 2018 have only consolidated over time and we've stayed connected. So I'm really happy to be here. Thank you, Pooja. So you're also part of the Zero Project Impact Transfer Program and uh, uh, this is also our effort uh, to promote those extraordinary uh, innovations like the one that you are uh, working on. So uh, in, in um, Let's put it that way, 3D print is not a, a goal in itself, it's just a, a tool to create personalized, available, affordable uh, tools, devices. No? Uh, Chapel Food Organization is, uh, is a little different, it's not based on 3D print, but it has the same mission. No? So, uh, Puja, could you elaborate a little on what exactly is, is, your, is your method, uh, why is it so successful and what, what, what is your relationship to 3D print? Are you using it already and if not, why not? So, Michael, as you know, but I'll just elaborate a little about the organization because uh, a lot of people here may not be knowing. So, we are a non-governmental charity committed to restoring the mobility of people who lost their limbs in the developing world and across the war-torn areas. The technology that we use is very distinctive because uh, it has been designed to meet the socio-cultural, occupational, and religious needs of our people. However, what evolved found universal appeal and is currently being used across 34 countries. Now, the Jaipur limb uh, is uh, high performance. It is low weight. It's low cost. And it is robust. 
In fact, uh, in one of the videos uh, where Fritz was uh, translating, it said that it's being sold at $60. So I'll just give people a sense of the cost of uh, our technology. A below knee limb costs 60 and an above knee limb costs $100. But that is cost to the organization. All devices are provided free of cost uh, to patients. We are not selling anything. The other thing is that the technology is very rapid fit. So uh, from right from the time of measuring to fitting, we take one to three days. And considering that uh, there is an astounding number of uh, amputees still waiting to get limbs, uh, I think this turnover rate is of paramount importance. So on those two counts, when we are talking about cost, we are talking about speed, we are talking about uh, weight, uh, we are already doing a good job. Uh, now, when we are talking about 3D printing, uh, as you've seen in the videos, that uh, although we are not really uh, using it uh, for most of our work, but we did try our hand at 3D printing. What we use is high-density polyethylene pipes. Now, these pipes are used for making the socket of the limb. And these are, again, very strong. They are light. The fabrication process is so simple, it's practically a one-step process. And of course, it's all inexpensive because, uh, you know, affordability has to be weaved into anything that is being used in the low resource setting. However, since 3D printing is an emerging technology with inflated expectations, uh, I must emphasize the fact that the expectations from the technology are inflated because uh, we felt that this would be the answer to all our problems and it would solve everything. But, uh, you know, what, what are the things, why, what are the reasons for selling 3D printing? Those, on all those fronts, high-density polyethylene was working very well for us. But still, we started making uh, sockets using 3D printers. But what happened was that these sockets uh, were not strong enough for load-bearing. And if we try to use the newer materials, like you just mentioned, now it's not just plastics that are being 3D printed. You can also use carbon fiber filaments for making sockets. But as soon as you do that, the cost element comes in. It's no longer inexpensive. Also, the time taken for 3D printing is already much longer than the time we take using our existing technology. So I, for one, believe that, you know, if you are innovating and if you're trying to use a new technology, you should be trying to do it in an attempt to solve a problem, and not because there is a new technology, so let's just use it. That should not be the approach. In fact, uh, as far as customization, because as Paloma would uh, you know, understand that uh, customization is another uh, USP of uh, 3D printing, that you can customize parts. Also, you can get complex geometries. Now, as far as prosthesis goes, I think customization has been exaggerated. The need for customization does not exist in prosthesis because all we do is make the socket. Everything else is just taken off the shelf. So you don't have to make everything and, you know, for every patient, the foot, the joints, they're all same for everybody. So you don't need to customize. Also, the geometries, it's just a cylinder or a quadrilateral uh, container for a stump. So these are not very complex shapes. So as far as 3D printing goes, Michael, I feel that the most evidence-based and proven applications in prosthetics are, of course, rapid prototyping, without a doubt. It has transformed rapid prototyping uh, like uh, nobody could have imagined. Uh, design iterations are very easy now because you can make multiple designs, you can, and there's a much greater margin of failure here because you can fail and make another prototype without any difficulty. And the other thing is what you mentioned in the introduction is the low volume manufacturing. So those are some of the applications in prosthetics. Like Fritz had mentioned that the first prosthetic leg was made in 2008, but it was just made. Nobody if it was made in 2008 and it was found to be so successful, it would have been adopted by now. But you don't see prosthetic legs being 3D printed even now. So that is our take on uh, 3D printing. 
Uh, thank you, Pujas. This was really enlightening, and uh, uh, I think it's also excellent uh, to, to put uh, 3D into, into context. Uh, uh, and uh, it will not be the solution, as you mentioned, to everything. Uh, but it's just a new innovative approach. And uh, there will be uh, still a big need of organizations like you who know how to work in low-income countries, how to, how to produce efficiently, how to share, um, how, to, how to connect with customers and everything. So it's, a, it's a, maybe a kind of, of new, new technology on the block uh, that needs to be, uh, again, as always, uh, adjusted to the local context and to existing solutions. So thank you for this, uh, for this uh, great contribution. Anything you add, uh, Pucha, as a last uh, sentence, something that came to your mind? Yeah, I also wanted to add, Michael, that uh, you know, all free and all open source is not necessarily good. One reason why 3D printing went into a lot of disrepute is because a lot of organizations and individuals started selling it like a do-it-yourself DIY solution for prosthetics. And prosthetics is complex. And uh, you, not anybody, I mean, they have just volunteers who come and start printing a hand without any understanding of biomechanics or uh, how it's going to function. I'm not talking about the My Human Kit. That's an exception. Now these, uh, and, and what they what uh, the worst thing they would do is they'll put everything on YouTube. And suddenly it will catch everybody's fancy because you will see one child in Africa wearing this uh, Iron Man hand or a Spider-Man hand or something. These are very unrealistic uh, solutions. People want to look normal. Nobody wants to look like Spider-Man or Iron Man in real life. You know, it, It's okay on YouTube. I have never seen any child in, in India who has come to me wanting a hand like that. These hands, they will say that are very they uh, can be produced uh, very quickly. But let me tell you, they break even quicker than they are produced. They don't have the strength. And also, they're cheap. But they're not just cheap in cost. They're cheap in quality as well. So sometimes, by trying to oversell a technology, you, you take away the beauty of you know, what all possibilities exist. In fact, we are currently waiting for 3D printers to start using materials more like metals, elastomers, like silicon, so that we can use it for, for uh, parts that uh, require load-bearing and strength, which it currently doesn't have. But yes, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's not an option that we are not considering for uh, other applications, but certainly not for making complete artificial limbs. Uh, thank you, Pucha, and um, I think this was also really important to point this out, and uh, it also underlines the importance of working together and creating groups and communities of people that, uh, that work together to create uh, those solutions uh, for people with disabilities in high quality that everybody needs and everybody deserves. So I hope you also keep connected with us and, and, and join in into this group that we are uh, going to set up uh, with uh, Paloma and hopefully many others that, uh, that de develop this together. So thank you, pa uh, Pucha, and now we're moving on. We still got some more uh, to show, some other approaches. The first one to show is uh, Invatur, the Invatur program from Russia, which has been shortlisted this year for the Zero Project. What is special about Invatur is the focus on employment opportunities that are created by the 3D technology. So it's not only about the technology itself. Uh, Fritz, let's watch the video. A Russian-speaking newsca newscaster is announcing a report. On the screen behind her, you can make out someone in a wheelchair working in a modern workshop. He wears a mask. In his hand, he holds a face shield. After the presenter has finished, the video starts. The man in the wheelchair is checking the quality of the face shield. A mannequin in a showroom wears a complete set of protective clothing, coverall gloves, mask, and face shield. The man in the workshop in front of a 3D printer, finished face shields are stacked on the table. The man explaining something to a reporter, he speaks Russian. After the interview, an archive recording shows the opening of the 3D workshop where people with and without disabilities work together. Several people cut a red ribbon. A woman being interviewed, the reporter of this feature is talking about it. Both are speaking Russian. Again, footage from the workshop, a woman explaining something to a group of young people, 
another woman working on a printer. A man in a suit greets visitors and is then seen in an interview. He too speaks Russian. After the interview, we, we will see young people in wheelchairs, all wearing yellow t-shirts, outdoors, practicing getting over obstacles, such as steps and ramps. They are accompanied by young people without disabilities, who are also wearing the same color t-shirts. They seem to have fun by doing the training. Thank you, Fritz. Um, so this was Invato from Russia, and um, the, the person interviewed was Andrei Burnikov, uh, who is also, uh, as mentioned, uh, the, uh, the person behind uh, this model and uh, also a person that we hopefully can, can uh, stay connected with in the, in, in the future of developing uh, this community uh, of, of uh, 3D print solutions. Now to a final video. Uh, it's again a different approach to the same technology, this time from Drone Lab in Brazil. The project uh, developed by Professor Renato Frosch is about using drones to measure important monuments and then building miniature models that can be touched uh, and explained. So let, let us watch uh, this final video. On the screen, a colorful logo is created. A man with glasses sits in front of a 3D printer. Rolls of colorful filaments can be seen behind him on the printer. The insert says that the man's name is Renato, working at Proyecto Impresión 3D. Renato says that he was curious to learn how Ana Lucia, a blind colleague from Colombia, sees the world. A young woman wearing dark glasses. Ana Lucia sits in an office. In the background, people are working on computers and other equipments. Renato explains that they visited the Monumento a la Bandera. That's when they got the idea to recreate it as a 3D model. Now the 3D model is ready. Ana Lucia sits at the table and touches it. She says that the model reminds her of the visit to the original. Renato tells us that he used photos and pictures and drawings to create the design on the computer. He says that the design is now available to everyone on the internet, but that only Ana Lucia has the prototype. Thank you. Thank you again, Fritz, for this, uh, for this quite uh, uh, excellent uh, audit description. Um, we are now finishing, we have finished the official part. I would, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure if Paloma is still in the call. Paloma, are you, are you still with us? Yes, I'm here. Yeah, I know this is quite a surprise for you, but you've now seen this whole, uh, uh, this whole session, and uh, I would like now you and then also Apucha to ask for some, some takeaways, uh, something that you was remarkable for you as an expert in that field uh, that was shown and discussed here. Anything that, 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 that uh, struck you, anything that, uh, that you were, yeah, that we, maybe you're not so familiar with, some takeaways from, from your side. Sorry, I, I didn't hear you the, the last part. Uh, are there any, any, any takeaways? Is there anything that you learned from uh, what you saw in the video that was, uh, that was uh, remarkable for you? Well, uh, I think what Puya have said, uh, it's really very interesting. I remember when I was studying uh, to be an occupational therapist, there was a book here called uh, High Poor Food. And uh, I think the, the most important thing is uh, to adapt the, the way to produce the things to the context. And sometimes 3D is the solution sometimes not. I think uh, there are a lot of uh, possibilities to use this uh, technique in different areas, but I'm totally agree. Uh, it's not the, it, it is not the, the only solution, and you have to have a knowledge regarding materials, and for example, the, the way you are going to use the product, if it is going to support a uh, strange or not. So it's a, it's a simple uh, technique, but not that simple. It's very affordable, but you need to, to work in a multidisciplinary team, and you need to know some things regarding materials, physics, mathematics sometimes, and of course, you have to listen 
the people you are going to work with in order to create something that is going really to, to improve their daily life. Thank you, Paloma. Um, I'm handing over to Fritz sitting next to me. He has uh, also some, yes. some, uh, uh, future, uh, some uh, thoughts into uh, where this could lead us. Yeah, I have uh, one question to both of uh, you. Uh, here in Vienna, there is uh, an office of Otto Bock. I, I think you might know them. They are like world leader in prosthesis. And uh, I would be interested, if there, is there a kind of cooperation with companies like Otto Bock? Are they sharing their knowledge, their ideas? Uh... Would be a question to you, Paloma, first. Well, um... I, I, I worked with Autobock uh, products when I work at uh, the orthopedic shop, but now at Fundación Once, uh, we are not really um, working with them. Probably if we want to, to contact them, it would be easy uh, to do it. But uh, we are not now working in prosthetic or orthesis. We are working with assistive products, so not now, but I'm sure we could collaborate in future if, if we have those aims, yes. Okay, uh, thank you, Paloma. Puja, any, any thoughts from your side, any, any takeaways uh, when you uh, watched uh, this uh, almost full hour now with us? Yes, Michael, I think I'll first like to respond to Fritz uh, about uh, Otobock. Uh, we work very closely with Otobock, and uh, like he said, they are the world leaders in prosthetics, uh, although most of their uh, products are uh, designed to address the needs of people in the West. So they are prohibitively expensive for people in uh, most parts of the world. But uh, you would be uh, you know, surprised to know that the government of India, because as of now, we have a very, very proactive uh, prime minister, and the government of India has now signed a memorandum of understanding and is in partnership with Otobock. And uh, we are producing components that are Otobock design, Otobock quality in India. And the government is providing these free of cost to amputees in India. So that is another, that's not the Jaipur limb, but that is the Otobock limb provided in India, made in India under the supervision of uh, experts from Otobock but also free of cost. So that is something that is not happening anywhere in the world that Otobock is given free because Otobock is not a, a charity anywhere. And uh, so we work very closely and uh, we learn a lot from them uh, regarding research designs and uh, aesthetic componentry. In hey. fact, Fritz, we have our own center in Colombia that you mentioned you're from <laughs> Colombia. So yeah. we have our own center, Jaipur Foot Center in Colombia. It's called uh, the Mahavir K. Mina. Okay. I believe K. Mina means walk. So it's in Medellin. Ah. Okay. Okay, uh, Pucha, any, any, any closing remarks? Anything uh, that uh, you yeah, want to, to share with us as, as almost the closing words? Yeah, so Michael, I'd like to say that, uh, uh, you know, no technology is good or bad. Every technology, you know, initially when it comes in, there is, uh, it goes through this hype of expect over, uh, you know, unrealistic expectations. But I think what is important is that it should be used judiciously. Uh, it's just like using the right tool for the right job. And like Paloma said, that uh, you have to work, uh, it's a multidisciplinary thing because as doctors, we can only give you what we need. And the engineers will design it, and then there will be material scientists, there'll be experts on 3D printers. So it has to be used judiciously, and uh, people who are designing 3D printers and who are designing materials and filaments for 3D printing have to be oriented to the needs of uh, you know, the, the applications that we want to use it for. So we are currently working on, Paloma would be, I think, interested in knowing that we are working on a hybrid 3D printer, because after 3D printing, there's a process of uh, post, uh, you know, where you have to remove the material, post-processing, where you have to buff and you have to use water jets and all that. So uh, we are working with 3D printing manufacturers on also 
working uh, with materials like elastomers so that we can make use it for silicones and all for sockets and uh, for making cosmetic components like people who've lost their fingers where strength is not an issue but cosmesis is and where customization is important so i think judicious use of 3d printing is uh, going to make its applications much wider and uh, the other thing is i don't think there's any technology that can be oversimplified you can't oversell 3d printing and say that just go home and make your own hand or make your own leg or you know something like that uh, i think it's making light of the science behind uh, it all so it, it really is not that simple that you know anybody can just take one print whatever they want and you know people making their own cars and stuff like that that's not going to happen those are very inflated and unrealistic expectations of a technology that's uh, transforming a lot of things already thank you so much pucha thank you also paloma pucha i think there's nothing to add to this uh, perspective for the future from from our side side so Thank you also, Fritz, for preparing and producing this, uh, this session with me together. And with this, I'm, I'm closing this, uh, this hour on, on 3D print and its uh, potential. Thank you.